Hi, welcome to Reality Check. My guest today is Stefan Albert, and I've been waiting for this day for a long time because uh, we spoke with Stefan about a year ago, and I've been watching what he's uh, working on for a long time. Stefan is the founder and CEO of Aisha, and uh, he will tell us about this uh, product uh, in one second. Stefan, welcome to Reality Check. Uh, my first question to you, what made you move from being group VP at ABB to the rocky world of a startup founder? Um, so what, what's your story? Uh, hey, well, firstly, um, great to be here and uh, thanks for the introduction. Um, wow. Um, you know, I, I, I jumped straight into the corporate world in, 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 with McKinsey uh, straight after my PhD uh, and ended up um, moving from there into even more hands-on type consulting. I wanted to get even more hands-on than I joined uh, ABB and did sort of a, a corporate program. I wanted to get more hands-on and so I ended up joining you know one of their their, their programs around driving uh, a new market around microgrids and grid edge technologies and all of these new technologies which got me deeper and deeper into the into the digital topic um and when i had the opportunity i thought you know this is this is maybe my my last chance if i don't do it now when to really go all the way and, and actually create my own organization and that's that's uh what i did um i was very excited uh, always by the transformational change that you can create as a consultant. Um, but it's just, you know, it was just so, ex so expensive for, for so many clients. And my question at first was, how can we share knowledge much more, much more effectively, but also cost effectively? And then came the idea of to do that, you need a human presence. Um, and a digital human is at the moment the closest thing that we can really get to to having a, a real human coach type support with a face, with a personality, with a voice. Um, and now thanks to LLM with a whole, a whole lot more capabilities. Uh, and that, that, that led me to the, to the world of Asia, digital humans. Uh, before we dive into uh, Maisha and uh, get introduced to this digital personality, uh, I have a question to you. What are your thoughts about generative AI? It's changing so fast, but is it just the hype or it's going to stay with us forever? Um, I think AI, we've seen a lot of like hype, if you want to call it, over the last 10, 15 years. It was always just around the corner. There was a lot of applications of it, but, you know, to very limited, you know, and who could really have the resources and the scale needed to be able to take advantage of it. Um, with generative AI, um, I think it was really with the, the chat GPT because GPT was around uh, for quite a while and these generative language technologies were around, but putting that user interface, that easy to access user interface with chat GPT, I think it just eventually is like popping the cork in a champagne bottle. Um, the champagne is in there, the, 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 <laughs> the goods are there. Um, and now we're just starting to see the beginning of it. So you know, you still see lots of issues, lots of limitations, uh, and every week, and there's another one this week, uh, there's, you know, something else coming out where these limitations are being broken down, it's becoming easier, it's becoming more accessible. Um, so I think the floodgates are open and we're going to actually really see it everywhere. So definitely not a hype, the beginning of a, of a true transformation. So you're talking about digital human and Aisha. So can you talk about the implementations uh, and the problems that you're solving with introducing digital humans to the world? Yeah. Um, so I think it, it really comes down to when do you need that human presence? Um, we spend on average, I think somewhere between eight and 10 or even more hours a day in front of a screen, whether it's a computer screen, a phone, maybe a TV or an iPad. And um, most of that time is dealing with text. We spend a lot of time dealing with text. And we've known for a long time that text is not the most powerful way to communicate. Humans like to communicate with humans. Uh, and if you go from text to voice, you get um, you know, a much stronger um, effect. 
And if you go from voice to digital human, so with a face, uh, especially if that face looks like a real human, you go one step further in actually um, building trust uh, with that with that digital um, interface, uh, believing the capabilities of, of the technology or, or the information that's behind there. Um, and people actually remember and learn more from a story, let's say, has been told with a digital human than one that has been, let's say, shared with text or even voice without the face um, that, that 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 shares all that additional information that we've been trained for you know thousands and thousands of years to to better understand. Um, we just actually finished a, a project recently with the University of Saint Gallen. Uh, someone actually did their pro their, their PhD looking at the benefits of voice bots versus chat bots and how it drives, um, say, increased trust with, uh, with the users. Uh, and then we did the next piece of research um, sponsored by InnoSwiss. We looked at what's the power of a digital human over and above that. Well, you said that humans prefer to interact with humans. Uh, mm -hmm. Let me challenge this. So yes, I agree that we prefer to deal with humans, but uh, do we prefer to deal with digital humans? So all the evidence that we have so far is that digital humans are essentially the most powerful form of communication, you know, versus chatbots, versus text, um, even versus voice bots. So it is incrementally better and getting closer to that, let's say, conversation with a, with a real human. So do I talk right now to real Stefan Albert or to the digital version of Stefan? Well, thanks to the joys of GPT, you'll never know. <laughs> <laughs> Should you know? Uh, my previous speaker was uh, talking about the ethics of AI. So should we always know whether we're talking to the real human or digital human? So um, I have a very clear view on this. But as you know, I've also got a podcast around digital humans and, and some of my guests have, have asked the same question. I think, I mean, for me personally, I think if it's if it's a digital anything, we should know that it is. You know, if it's a chatbot, there's nothing worse than chatting to, you know, a company thinking that you're chatting to a person, but then you actually realize that it's a, it's not a, there's no human, it's just a chatbot. Um, and I think with the digital human, it's exactly the same. It's a little bit easier. I think um, it's easier to tell with a with with a face with a digital human the technology. We're getting there, but you know it's still hard to be so good that you, that people wouldn't recognize in a natural conversation flow that you're not talking to a real human. Um, so I think we have that benefit, but that's disappearing very quickly. Maybe in the next one year, two years, it'll be it'll already be gone. Um, so then it's going to be very much up to the you know the, the developers to to do the right thing. And for me, that's always to be to be very honest about what's a what's digital and, and what's a, what's a real human. Great, thank you. So now let's dive into the world of Aisha. So can you introduce us um, to these digital human? Yeah, sure. I mean, I think the, the easiest way to do that would maybe be to just give you a, a quick look. So let me just um, share my screen here. So here's a quick example of Barry Kuntz. He's a great public speaking coach. Uh, the top executives. He's also executive himself in, in the North American automotive scene and an all around great guy. Now, we've been working to create a digital twin um, based on his book. Uh, this is obviously how he looks and, um, and sounds. And, and the goal here was to support him as he you know, prepares his own students or it gives him the ability to actually work with, you know, thousands of students globally um, who want to use uh, we want to get access to, to this knowledge around how to become a better public speaker. So let's give it a go. I'm Barry too, Barry Kuntz, digital twin. There are three ways I can help you present with impact. First, if you're short on time, I can give you an executive overview. Second, take my 10 minute boot camp that covers the three key skills to speaking like a pro designing your presentations for ultimate impact, delivering with compelling style and staying on message. Third, if you want the real Barry Koontz, I can. Okay, I'm just going to pause him. So I know when I, I want to have the executive overview, so I'm just going to go straight to that. Help you get in contact. Pick one of the three or pick them all. To become a better public speaker, 
learn three fundamental skills. First, how to frame your presentation for ultimate impact. Second, how to use the pause delivery technique to deliver your presentation with compelling style. I'm going to pause him again quickly. Say, I really just want to know about the pause delivery technique. I can um, shush him, go to the end of his what he's saying, and then just um, actually ask him directly what that would mean. Third, learn. Could you tell me more about the pause delivery technique? The pause delivery technique is a method of public speaking that emphasizes pacing and strategic pauses. The first pause is used to show that you are thinking about what you're going to say, which can create anticipation and interest. The second pause, also known as the got that pause, allows the audience to think about what you just said, adding emphasis and authority to your point. This technique also involves maintaining eye contact with the audience and delivering ideas at a digestible pace. Thanks. Why would you say Obama is considered a great speaker? Impactful speakers like President Obama leverage proper use of pace and well-timed eye contact. They don't paint a picture for their audience. Instead, in their silent pauses they give each member of the audience their own brush, and in their silent pauses, each member of the audience paints what they thought they heard. Take a look at this short video of Obama. I think you'll agree. Okay, this is really cool. But now I, I have everything I need here. I can just go straight to this particular video and, and, and learn more about that. Okay, well, look, I think that's enough for now. I just want to give you a quick demo and give you a bit of a look and feel of how it works and, and I hope you enjoy that. Basically, it, uh, you know, it, it, it creates a, a digital twin, an avatar, if you will, um, using deepfake technology, um, leveraging any, any form of um, available tools for that. Uh, and what it does is it basically brings together all of the, the speech, voice, text capabilities, um, as well as the AI engine in the back, where it, it creates all of the um, suggested questions and answers. So that uh, the user, in this case Barry, can really review it, make sure that it, it says or he says exactly what he would like him to say, uh, that it comes across with his personality and his words. Um, once he's reviewed that, it then can automatically create all of those, um, all of that, all of that media that, that we saw just there. And it has hundreds and hundreds of different answers based on different topics that people could ask. Um, I think the only other, the only other thing to mention is. If you don't want to use uh, avatars the way this is set up, you can also go through the effort, you know, using a webcam, and it'll you can just actually record answers yourself, but it'll put it put it back together as though it was a, a live conversation that you can have. So uh, I presume that uh, the his book uh, or books had been uploaded as the knowledge yep. base uh, for as a foundation for for the answers. Exactly. Yeah. Okay. How difficult, it's a relatively quick process, yeah. Uh, how difficult is it to create a new avatar? So if I want to have my digital twin uh, mm -hmm. done, so how mm -hmm. difficult, how expensive it is, how long does it take? So how do I become Aisha myself? Yeah, so we, we use third-party tech to just create the avatar because that's become really quite standard um, at this point in time. Um, there are some technologies out there that you can use, which are super, super fast, you know, based on a photo, but relatively bad quality. Um, there are others that you can use, which are super high quality, um, but um, can be quite slow and quite expensive to, to implement. Uh, it really depends on, on what the goal is. So if you're doing it for people to use on their phones and it needs to be just quick and, and, and relatively easy, um, these are, are certainly come down in, in, in cost quite a lot. If you're using for personal accounts, it's 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 a lot uh, more cost effective than if you need it for a let's say a business purpose. Um, but you're you're looking at you know typically hundreds or a thousand dollars or so to to create the avatar and then you pay for the media. Okay. Okay. Um... So if I want to have a digital twin doing this interviews, uh, then I would need to invest uh, between a um, uh, few hundreds to a few thousand dollars to make it 
done. Yeah, absolutely, yeah. Okay, got it. Very good. And uh, how do you, how do people use Aisha? So, who are your customers, and what problems are you solving for them? Um, so, with my background, I really focused on that sort of you know how do you how how can you share knowledge and and you know coach people, um, and so the the three projects um, that I think of now are all really in the HR space. So we have Barry, where he's actually the coach. We go one step, one level away from that, and um, uh, did a POC with ABB, where they're looking at how they can automate that sort of. Um, simple coaching, reminding, getting people excited because they've built up all of these trainings, um, some of them in person, some of them digital. But how do you make sure that no one gets left behind, that everyone knows which training they could do, what would be most relevant, give them that full access and suggestions on, on what they could do next and do it in a way that will basically motivate people to continue that sort of professional learning journey. So there we created a a digital human that would be able to um, speak to, uh, you know, this 100,000 plus employees. Um, we started in English, but of course um, would expand to multiple languages and we're still in discussion with ABB on, on next steps there. To be able to have that conversation, ask them what their needs are, what their area of interest is, you know, what their level is and, you know, do they have people reporting to them or not? Because that opens up certain other specific training. So that was all around coaching people to understand what training options are available. And um, we just, uh, it was just announced um, two weeks ago, I believe at Kickstarter, um, which is Kickstarter Innovation, where startups work with uh, large Swiss corporates um, that Swisscom is also now going to do a uh, project uh, with Asia. And there the focus is they're looking at um, expanding their internal trainings and offering them to some of their B2B customers. And the goal there was to see how uh, Asia could be a new um, panel, if you will, for people to learn about what the trainings are, to get some basic information um, and get excited once again to, to sign up, but that would be then more um, facing customers. Do you have a feeling how much better uh, using Aisha compared to the traditional ways of training employees? Um, so there's different elements to it. So I think if if you need to have, let's say, uh, a very standard amount of like information that someone just needs to, to memorize and get in their head, I'm not sure. Like the digital, you can have videos, you can have quizzes and all of this can be already integrated in, in learning management systems. Um, I think where the digital human really comes into play is providing all of that additional support, you know, answering those additional questions that people have. You know, normally it's a very one-way process. You know, you basically sit there and you get fed this information. Um, and very often, I mean, uh, you know, the corporate corporate trainings, you know, you sit there, the most exciting bit about a corporate training is that you get to spend some time with some interesting people, whether it be the trainers or, or the other people in the organization. Um, the knowledge that you gain is often, even if it's really good knowledge, is it, it's not the right knowledge at the right time. And then you go back and you think, yes, I want to change everything, but then you kind of get, you know, back into cold water and, you know, you just have to keep on, keep your head above water, keep on swimming. And all of that great learning that you did is difficult then to, to put into, into place. And I think here, the, you know, the ability to have that guide, you know, um, the co-pilot, if you will, that's just supporting you in your everyday, uh, coaching you on specific topics. Um, there, I, there I see the true power of, of this sort of digital human. Um, and being a digital human, it's more personable. It's I think it's easier, and, and and you learn more from having this sort of this person there who's who's supporting you along that journey. Yeah, uh, this is interesting. I would expect that every CEO of the large organization should have uh, their digital um, twin done. So I imagine uh, the the first presentation about the values of the company should be done by CEO. 
And maybe even all the consecutive uh, trainings and answers to the questions should be done by CEO. And uh, the audience will be much more receptive to the messages come from the, from the top. So yeah. ability to talk to your CEO at every moment in time can, uh, can be an interesting uh, approach. Uh, this this is one use case that I, I really, really like, and it could be for positive things, it could be for negative things or just neutral things. Um, you know, if you, let's say you want to get, you want to understand more um, about a company, um, say ABB, my, my old, uh, old employer, you say, okay, well, you know, there's a job going, but I want to know more about this company, about the, the leadership of the division or the CEO, and you can go and have a chat with that person. Of course, they, they can't answer everything and everything would, would need to be sort of predefined because, you know, you don't want to take the risks probably of having a, a GPT speak with your face. But, you know, you, you can have it predefined. You can share lots of comments. You can you can do it using an avatar. Or you can even do it using a webcam uh, or a video for higher quality and just, you know, share the, you know, the top 50, 100 questions. But then it really comes from that from that person, from the CEO, you get a feel of the company, you get a feel of the leadership. I think, you know, if I was wanted to get a job, I would love to do that. So I think it's a really positive use case. A neutral use case might be, you know, um, at the um, investor forum once a year to be able to speak to the CEO. Okay, there's a bunch of, bunch of questions and answers that he has time to do live perhaps. And then, the, you know, there could be another 100, 200 questions and answers that he shares um, that people can just sort of, you know, have that conversation, ask the question, and the most relevant answer will be then, will be then shared back to, back to the user. Uh, and a third case, you know, if there's an organizational transformation, and I've, I've gone through this uh, at ABB, no less, um, you get a TV presentation of, hey, yes, we're going to, you know, do these major changes, this part of the organization is going to go and blah, blah, blah. And then everyone sits and waits for a week or two weeks to get the email, to have a conversation, to find out what's really going on. It could be so much nicer. Yes, you still have this maybe one presentation live, so everyone gets the information at the same time. But then you get a link and you can go and actually have a chat and say, hey, what's going to happen to my you know, job or to the organization? How is it going to impact this or that? And once again, you know, for these large changes, there's time to prepare all of the different standard uh, frequently asked questions so that people can actually get more knowledge and need more information and maybe reduce that rumor mill just a little bit. I love your use cases, especially the second one. Every public company should be uh, able for every uh, minor investor, not just the big investment Mm -hmm. uh, big investor, institutional investors uh, to give answers to their questions because reading through financial report can be a difficult task. So mm -hmm. having ability to have a Q&A with, uh, with the people that are running this public company for anyone who has in, even a single share can be an interesting uh, way of communication with, with the company. Uh, yeah. I, I really like this idea. Yeah, and it could go further. It could also be, let's say, your sustainability reporting, um, to basically have that also prepared, so that it's not just for the financial reporting, but also for the sustainability reporting. Um, that different stakeholders can basically get get more out of the more information uh, and more of a personal uh, understanding of what's happening than you know just the rather dry text that's usually shared in the in, in the report. When you present the concept of digital human uh, to your potential customers and the existing customers, what's their feedback? Um, if I go back about a year, um, the feedback was, isn't this uncanny valley stuff? Um, I don't really get that as much anymore. People, I think, have really shifted their mindsets. They're seeing more of this is becoming more normal. And also the quality of the digital humans uh, is, is so good now like that it's um, that you really start to get that, uh, that feeling like you're really having this conversation on this, or, you know, maybe it's a pre-recorded feel, but it's, 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 it really is like a, a real person. So the uncanny valley 
has been, and, and there's a, a professor out in Australia who's done a lot of research on this, a very doctor, um, faculty member. And, you know, they showed that a digital human has about the same negative effect as having a slightly distorted video of a real person. So if you let's say you have a person who's stretched, you know, 5% or something, you know, slightly distorted, slight delay in speech or whatever, a digital human actually performs as good or better than some of these distortions of real video, um, which is quite telling, I think. It's, you know, we're getting to that level of, of quality now that um, it's, it, it comes across as almost real. So how do you verify that the answers you're getting are not hallucinations? Yeah, so there's, there's basically two kinds of digital humans. Um, the, the ones which are based on predefined responses. Um, this is like super helpful for, let's say, you know, corporate communications where you just can't take the risk of saying something wrong. Uh, you want to make sure that every statement that, you know, let's say the CEO says is actually correct and approved before it comes up. So in this case, you use a, a predefined chatbot. That removes that risk altogether. And then it's just a question of making sure that you do you have you use search or chat GPT to select the right uh, the right answers uh, that have already been predefined. The next level is having a full GPT-based um, uh, conversation or other LLM. Um, and there it's all about having the guardrails in place. Um, there's a lot of settings already that you can use, to be honest, that limit. So you can use, you know, say everything has to be based on own data. You know, the, the level of randomness can be minimized. Um, temperature, so on, can be changed. These are all different things that you can do to really reduce the answers to, let's say, known facts as much as possible. At the end, a really good hallucination maybe could still come through. So I don't think there's, you know, 100% guarantee. Um, but, you know, you have to look at some public, public, public speeches, presidents and whatnot, and you see that even what they say is sometimes you, you think they're hallucinating. Um, <laughs> so does it have to be better than a real human? Um, maybe. Uh, will it ever be perfect? Maybe not. Thank you. So what's, how do you see the future of um, Aisha and digital humans uh, going forward? So let's say a year from now, uh, where do you plan to be? Um, the, the critical thing I think is, is ease of access, usability, and the ability to be able to seamlessly connect into different types of needs, whether that be predefined, whether that be LLM based or generative AI based um, conversations. Uh, whether it be real videos or avatars, um, to be able to have users rapidly and easy create these solutions um, to their needs. I think that's going to be the, the critical thing. After that, it's just going to be cost and scaling. You know, the theme that uh, comes quite often uh, when we discuss the uh, AI solutions with my speakers uh, is is AI going to replace people or is it going to be a uh, enabler technology to make us more productive? Um, I think one thing is clear that there's, you know, with great power comes risk and responsibility. Um, we've seen that I think in every industrial revolution, you know, people were, you know, um, People really believe that, you know, I guess, you know, the first steam engines were going to, to, to ruin, you know, good hardworking jobs. Of course, that didn't happen. Uh, electrification was going to do the same. Um, internet um, computers were going were gonna to do the same. This, I think, we're once again at that, at that position where we're at a whole new level. Um, I think with each of these changes, a lot of wealth was created and that wealth is probably not always created equally. Um, so there is that definitely that risk uh, that the, the true leaders, you know, we've already seen the early 
successful implementations of, of AI, companies like Google and Facebook that could really optimize it for their benefit have, have done exceedingly well. And now with this sort of new world of AI, is it going to make it worse or is it actually going to make it better in the sense that it's going to become more um, accessible uh, evenly to small businesses, individuals, large companies that will basically be a rising, a rising tide that lifts all boats. Um, I'm relatively positive uh, on the outcomes personally, um, but you know, of course, all of the, the risks need to be managed in a sensible, in a sensible way. Thank you. Uh, now the question from my previous speaker, um, as with many technologies, we tend to put them everywhere. So we tend to implement uh, at every place, at every application, at every solution, the answer is AI. Let's do AI. That's like a knee-jerk reaction. Um, so do you see uh, areas where AI is used where it shouldn't be? Yeah, this is a really, really good question. Um, my gut instinct tells me we ain't seen nothing yet. It's what we think is already a lot is going to be a small fraction of what is actually going to be happening in, in a very short time span. Um, we will need to, and this was a great conversation we had at the Microsoft Startups event just, just the other day. Um, we're going to need to rethink everything about what we believe is the bricks and mortar of, of you know, our businesses, um, of our organizations um, with AI. Uh, it, it, you know, it, it's not going to be a question maybe of, okay, where do we put the AI uh, in our solutions? You know, will the solution that we have today kind of be a backup and the AI, you know, and that interface will become the new solution? Um, I think it's going to rapidly change almost every aspect of, of what we're doing and it's just beginning. I was thinking at some point through these discussions that uh, uh, one of the uh, speakers said uh, we will be elevated in our job. So he was saying that the junior developer will be able to perform as the senior developer and the architect will be almost like a god uh, status with the support of um, AI. Um, and when you were talking about your vision, I felt that we become managers uh, rather than um, people doing the mundane routine tasks. So we outsource this routine task to AI but we still have to be supervisors. We have to be uh, watching over the decisions made by uh, AI or suggested by AI. What, what, what's your thoughts about this? Um, it kind of reminds me of autonomous driving. Yeah. Uh, so keep your hands on the wheel. <laughs> we had a little bit of lane control. Then we had sort of autonomous driving, keep the hands on the wheel. You know, I think next we're going to have autonomous driving, no hands on the wheel. Um, and then they're going to find out that that's so much safer than hands on wheel. And then they're going to actually say, you're not allowed to touch, you know, you're not allowed to supervise the driving <laughs> because you will just make. So I think we're going to, you know, I, I wouldn't put these limitations on there. It's a time. It's, it's a time thing. The things that we think AI can't do as good as we can it will be able to do. I think it'll go one level higher to sort of more ethical and what do we want it to do is a different question than what can it do. Um, you know, could it be a better judge than a real job? judge? Yes, probably, not, not long from now. Do we want to take out the human for when we're judging people, let's say, in, in trial and in, in legal cases? Maybe we don't. You know, maybe that's, but, but that, that becomes then more a question of ethics and decisions around um, where AI is allowed to play and isn't allowed to play. So obviously we have to do that. Um, you know, what are the goals of AI? You know, what's, what's the, what goals do we want to set it? Um, that's obviously, I think, is, is the human decision. So it's a manager in that role, but the, the level of management will continue to, to increase. It won't be, here's a suggestion, 
yes or no, it'll be okay now run everything autonomously. But if we don't like the way you're running things, you know, we're going to swap you out for a better AI. Or we're going to, we're going to adjust you. Thank you very much. Now, now um, what's your question to my next speaker? We've got this new generative AI. Um, my question would be, how long will it be until AI will really think of its own solutions, create them, test them, and then basically, you know, you go do that process from A to Z, you know, and, and basically say, hey, here is a molecule. Um, we thought that this could be helpful. We've created some solutions. Here's the process that we think you need to do to be able to make the molecule. This is our, let's say, digital human testing. So not my kind of digital human, but like um, based on the biology of a person, what we think will happen. Um, and basically be able to provide a, a drug. So do all of that foresight, the forward thinking. Um, I think that that's, that's going to be a new age of digital when we get past this sort of backwards looking, you know, pattern recognition to truly sort of inspired thinking and evaluation and creation. So basically when we will go from digital human to digital researcher. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Great. Thank you very much. Before we uh, finish our uh, conversation today, uh, Stefan, I uh, wonder if one of my viewers want to try uh, Aisha, um, uh, can you send us the link uh, so they can um, have yeah. their own experience? Um, Barry, um, I've spoken to, he's happy for people to, to go out and, and test his uh, his digital human, um, so I will uh, I will happily share the the link with you for that. Oh, excellent! Very good. I'll put this uh, in the description uh, below and in the first comment. Uh, this link. Perfect. Excellent. Thank All you right. so yeah. much for spending your time. Uh, I thoroughly enjoyed our conversation, Stefan. And I wish you all the luck in the coming year because for a startup. Uh, you need a little bit of luck. You all, you seems to be in the right place at the right time. With a little bit of luck, you'll be super successful. Thank you. Yes, it's exciting, but very fast moving field. Um, and uh, I'll take all the luck I can get. <laughs> Thank you. <Rika. laughs> Thank you, Stefan. Bye.